so you get so you don't get fall too far behind. So this is how far we got last week. We went right from the start and the basic ideas. We then spent the whole lecture deriving Hill's equations, which we then looked at the linear solution of in terms of quadrupoles and drift spaces and the thin lens uh, quadrupole. I mean, it was quite a lot of painful in places to do the expansion of the derivation of Hill's equations. In some textbooks, it's like three lines, like Wilson just like motivates it in terms of a linear restoring fourth and writes down a SHM style equation. For me, that's not very satisfactory because you lose the information about the uh, what happens in the dipoles, one of a row squared term. So a, a rigorous derivation or more rigorous than that, I think you get more physics out of it. So that's as far as we've got. And we figured out we can write the solution to our particle motion in our accelerator in the linear regime as a, a bunch of matrices for each element. So each element has a matrix attached to it. And that tells what happens to a ray at the position and angle of a particle and, and transforms it through that element. And we figured out there were four matrices for quadrupoles, focusing and defocusing, drift, and a thin lens quadrupole, which is handy for back and calculations. There's one more matrix to do, and that's a dipole. Um, and there is a matrix for a dipole. You might think naively straight away it's just a drift element. Because remember, we rolled in the curvature uh, reference trajectory in our coordinate system. So from the point of view of, a, of the ideal particle, you go in at zero, zero, you emerge at zero, zero, because the, because the coordinate system itself rotates through the element. But actually, the, there is a, a non-trivial transfer matrix because you get focusing effects. The one over rho squared in Hill's equation is giving you focusing in the plane of bending. So we have a, cur a curved coordinate system, so that actually follows the curvature of the magnet. So you have some crazy bunch of um, dipoles giving you a very weird design orbit in the lab frame uh, the ideal particles going bending left and right. From its point of view, it's staying on zero, zero on the reference trajectory, but there is focusing. So that's what a dipole looks like. And this is it from the top view. This is called a sector dipole, where the exit planes are 90 degrees to the ideal particle trajectory. You often see rectangular dipoles as well, where that's not the case. Uh, this is the simplest case for us to deal with. The only effect you have to calculate is the focusing due to the curved reference trajectory. So, but, but it's easy to figure out because the this is the matrix we derive for a quadrupole, a focusing quadrupole, where big K, if you remember, had two contributions, little k from the gradient, and also the one over rho squared coming from the natural focusing in the, in the plane of the bending. So all you have to do is replace big K, not by a little k for a focusing effect of a gradient, but by what the one over rho squared, which arises from this natural body focusing. So if we let k equals 1 over rho squared, which is our pure bending contribution, we insert this big k into this matrix, we derive a matrix describing the action of, on the beam of this horizontally focusing dipole, where theta is the bend angle of the dipole and rho is its radius of curvature of the curved reference trajectory. So it looks very close to um, a rotation matrix, but there's a small effect coming in from focusing in the plane of the bending, and that's called natural or geometric focusing. So we get this guy, if it's not, if theta was very small, it looks close to a, just a, a unit matrix, but, it, but you get some contribution from this minus sign one over rho, giving you some focusing in the plane of the bending. So what happens in the, uh, that's a horizontal plane in, in a dipole, which normally we do with that case in these calculations, because we assume most accelerators are bend horizontally and don't bend very much vertically. In, in the vertical plane for a sector bend, it's just a drift because there's no natural focusing from the curved reference trajectory. So the transfer matrix horizontally for a dipole is this, and vertically it's just a drift. So as a little test of our calculation, a rhetorical question for you, if I have a dipole at bending angle 2 pi, so that's like going all around the circle, what matrix do I get and is it sensible? So I'll leave that for you to calculate. So now we come to our first composite element. So we've calculated the matrix for a focusing quadrupole. We've calculated the matrix for a defocusing quadrupole. And what we found is that a horizontally focusing quadrupole focuses horizontally and defocuses vertically. Similarly, a, a defocusing quadrupole defocuses horizontally and focuses vertically. And so it's always like, are we focusing in one plane and defocusing in another? So 
surely you want to focus on both planes at the same time. So how do we set this up? Well, it turns out, and this the, on this slide we'll talk about it, you can easily construct two quadrupoles together of alternate polarity, and this the, the net effect is to focus in both planes. So you get what's called a quadrupole doublet, and this gives you focusing horizontally and vertically. Now, how it works is like this. So we have this doublet, which is a simple example of a system with two quadrupoles. So we have one horizontally focusing quadrupole, one vertically focusing quadrupole, and some gap between them of distance d. So they each have focal lengths, f1 and f2. That's the f that appears in the thin lens transfer matrix, the product of k times l, has a unit of meters. Separation dis of distance d. And if you just sit down and multiply together your three matrices, your matrix for this quadrupole, then the drift, and then this quadrupole, so you have three two by twos, times them all together. Remember the, and, and you get some composite matrix. I haven't, I haven't proved, by the way, that you're allowed to do that, but you are, and I'll, I'll talk about it shortly. But if you multiply the matrix, uh, these matrices, you get a composite matrix. And remember the thin lens matrix for a quadrupole. What gave you the focusing was the 2, 1 element, the change of the angle with respect to the distance, horizontal distance from the angle going into the element. So if you then find the composite matrix, look at the 2, 1 element, that's one over the focal length of the whole system. So if you do that, if you do the calculation, that's what you get. Um, it's, it's like three or four lines. There's times the matrix together, look at the two on element, one over it is, the is, is one over the focal length. So you get this thing. So, so that's general, F1 and F2 can be anything. But if I now pick F1 and F to be equal minus F2, if I just pick that condition, then this term and this term, they cancel. They go away. The leading terms go away. And all I'm left with is this, which is going to be the same sign for both planes and give you focusing in both planes. So the doublet then focuses in both planes with a focal length f1 squared over d. So I can easily construct a system that focuses in both planes simply by combining horizontal and vertically focusing quadrupoles. And that's a really cool feature that's not very obvious when you first look at the quadrupole matrix. Now this, this, this led to the invention of alternating gradient structure at the end of the 40s, I think. So up until this point, we made accelerators just out of tilting the pole face of dipoles, which give you weak focusing. But once we figured out we can actually <laughs> alternate quadrupoles and do much stronger focusing, we then have the advent of these alternating gradient accelerators. And look at any accelerator now, you'll see alternating quadrupoles, giving you focusing in both planes. And that's a basic building block of all accelerators. So another rhetorical question, can you see in terms of ray tracing why this happens. Um, draw little diagrams, draw lines, draw little kicks, and can you, can you see in terms of how the rays go through a composite system why you get focusing in both planes? It's a fun exercise to do. So that's the doublet. Now, what I have got time to talk about, but other courses will, is the idea of a map. Now, so what we've done formally in terms of formal structure is we've described a particle in terms of a vector in its phase space. Our choice is position and angle, x and x prime. So we have some initial state vector describing the particle in our accelerator at some point. We then have a transformation that transforms that initial state vector to a, to a new vector after the effect of the element has been applied to it, like a quadrupole or a dipole, something like this. So mathematically, we have some particle at some point s naught. We want to find out where that particle is, position and angle, at some point S1, where S1 is greater than S0. And we have some transformation object that then transforms the phase space vector X0, S0 to S1. In general, that's some kind of complicated transformation. For the linear case, where we linearize Hill's equations, this map, this guy here, can be represented as a matrix. That's what we found for quadrupoles, dipoles, and drifts and things. So you have a representation, some matrix in the linear regime. So the general feature we have is if we have a linear system, we have a matrix representation of the transforming maps of our system. That's what we've done. We've represented a quadrupole by a linear map, which we write as a matrix. For a nonlinear system, I'm sure you know from maths, 
matrices don't work anymore, anymore. You have to find new ways of representing this transformation through an element, this map. For example, Taylor maps or Lee maps. That's beyond this course, but other courses you'll see in the Cockroft will have, will start off thinking, okay, you know all the linear stuff. Let's find other ways of representing this guy. So you can do nonlinear dynamics like sextopoles, octopoles, that kind of thing. That'll come in other courses. But, the, but our matrix is a map. It's just a linear map. And you can write it as a matrix. So once we've observed we can use matrices, all the power of linear algebra is suddenly at our disposal. And that's well good because, for example, I've said for the doublet case, I've combined three matrices together to form the overall composite matrix. So there's a rule for combining linear objects. It looks like this, that the map to go from S0 to S2 is the map to go from S0 to S1, then pre-multiplied by the map to go from S1 to S2. That's an intuitive result, you know, for matrices, but um, it's a formal result and a rule that we apply. Now, the matrix, the matrix the particle sees first is written to the right of these expressions. Again, that's intuitive. Imagine you're multiplying a phase space vector here. You first hit it by the first element, then hit the result of that by the second element. But in other uh, 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 representations, like Lee, for example, you won't be doing this. It'll be the other way around. So it, it is a formal structure, the way we write the matrices. It's not commutative. You know that. A and B is not the same as BA. That makes sense. If I have a particle X and X prime, I do a drift and a quadrupole. It's not the same as a quadrupole and a drift. So th that naturally makes sense, but it's associative. So you can form subgroups of our matrices. So I can find a composite bit of a beam line, find that matrix and put that between other matrices and find uh, uh, some kind of overall structure. But we must always maintain the order of the matrices algebraically. That's the same as we have to keep the beam line components in their correct order. That kind of makes sense. A useful map is what's called the one turn map. And this is a very, very powerful thing. And we'll study this a lot, probably in three weeks time is our next bit for us. So I will probably study it then. And, what, and this is a very central object in beam dynamics, the one turn map. So we start at some location S in a ring of circumference C and the one turn map is defined as the map or the matrix for one turn around the accelerator back to the same point. So I can find that, right? It's some object. And I can find it by multiplying all the elements in the whole ring all the way back around to the same point. Or I can do other stuff to, to get it, but that's the basic way of finding it. So it's defined as the map to go from S to S plus C, where C is the circumference or one turn. Which means if I want to do n revolutions of the ring from n applications of the same map to a single phase space vector, a single particle, I have to apply this map n times and we'll use this to define our concept of stability and w whether rings are stable or not a little bit later. So why are matrices useful? Well, this is not a maths course. This is very intuitive, you know, hands-on physics. But we've written all our equations in terms of matrices. Is this useful? Well, yes, it is, because all the four machinery, um, including the linear algebra, matrix multiplication, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, traces, similarity transformations, are all now available to us as being dynamicists to manipulate our system. And we can quickly, in the pub, compute the, the result of a few elements on the, beam, on, the, on the beam just by multiplying matrices together. And two by two matrices that are totally real is something you can do at A-level. So the formalism is quite simplistic on the surface, but actually there's a lot of stuff going on underneath that you can actually access once you have the formalism written down. So it's all very powerful. So what happens in a code? Well, you have these codes, you, know, you probably used them or you're gonna use them, like MAD and Placet and other things. Now, essentially what accelerator codes do is assume a piecewise continuous representation of the accelerator structure. There's my accelerator. I have a bunch of elements that have, each one has a position, a strength, a length, a sextopole, quadrupole, a BPM or everything. And it represents each of these elements by a matrix or a few matrices. For example, a drift space has a simple matrix, a quadrupole has a simple matrix. And it just writes down all the matrices and multiplies them all together. If you ask MAD how to compute, what's the beta function at a given point in the accelerator, first thing it does is it does this calculation and gets the, uh, the composite transfer matrix. Now, here's a cryptic comment. 
the number of matrices you have to worry about was not always the same as the number of elements because you may have extra matrices to handle things like edge focusing effects in, in some elements. I'm not really going to talk about that, but in a textbook you'll see tables of matrices and you'll see lots of extra ones for different, different situations. But you should always remember that ultimately our subject is, a, is, a, is an applied physics subject and we design lattices which hopefully will get built one day. So as a beam anamnesist, we think in terms of this, we have a, a transfer map for a given element with some position, some strength, and we calculate its beam dynamics, but then some chap comes along as an engineer and does an engineering drawing for accelerator and it ends up looking a little bit like that, which is very, very different to that. So in our head, we have linear transformations here. Here, we've got cryogenics and power supplies and cooling and all kinds of stuff to worry about. So there's that disconnect between our equations and a real accelerator. But it's quite nice to remember that. But really, what's going on in here, we can describe linearly as a bunch of M <coughs> linear equations. And so here we have an example. Here we have a calculation done with just the matrices we've just talked about. This is just actually um, a particle moving through a, um, a series of focusing and defocusing quadrupoles computed just with the matrix approach. So you can do that yourself. That's for a single pass through a system. And what if we take lots and lots of turns, lots of applications of the matrices, you get diagrams like this where we have particles evolving through the structure. Now this is a very, very well defined envelope of the particle motion. We'll, I'll, I will see why that happens in a second when we start looking at beta tron oscillations and, and, and the current Snyder formalism. And eventually, if, you, if you're really good, you can get around one whole turn of the accelerator. For example, this diagram here is the first ever beam to go around the LHC. So one splodge is the injected beam, and the other splodge is the first ever time on telly, because all the cameras in the control room, it got around one complete turn of the machine. So you can calculate why that's there and not there by using what we just described as formalism. Um, okay, so now we come on to part three. That's the Hill's equations, the linear solution of them, and that's in terms of a particle by particle idea. I apply a matrix to a given particle to find its motion through the accelerator. Remember last week we talked about temperature and pressure. Equivalently, we have, we have stability of accelerators, we have global properties. So now the lattice functions, what's called the current Snyder formalism, is a different view of this, uh, this whole linear picture. So it all goes back to Hill's equation, where, where we have some transverse motion in our accelerator. X is, is our variable, it's transverse position. X prime dx by dt is this conjugate variable. And we have this, this term here, this focusing term, where we have little k, which comes from the quadrupoles, 1 over rho squared, which comes from the natural focusing in the dipoles with a curved coordinate system. And we, and, and we, and we solve that using... Uh, our intuition and wrote the solution as a matrix. Note so I've written rho of s and k of s because now we know that rows and k's change through the accelerator if you're, in a, if you're in a dipole, if you're in a quadrupole, if you're in a drift, so on and so forth. So what it is, uh, being uh, atomical about it, second order differential equation for a system with periodic focusing properties. So what it's a bit like, if you just cross off the one over rho squared for a second, it's like a pendulum equation, where you have some fixed string constant k. But the restoring force, our, our string constant, is no longer a constant. It now changes with position. It's like we're oscillating on a pendulum, but gravity is changing as the swing of the pendulum evolves in time. That's what's happening. Different accelerator elements, different spring constants. So the spring constant k now depends on what magnet we're in. If we're in a quadrupole, if we're in a dipole, if we're in a drift. That's what's happening. So if k was constant, like we assumed in the last bit, there was no one, there's no one over rho squared, it's just a pendulum equation. It's just a sine or a cosine. Next element, same differential equation, different spring constant. So we have some kind of quasi-harmonic motion going on as the distance of the accelerator increases. And in fact, we can be firmer than that because if the machine has some periodicity L, it repeats after a distance L, so does K, and so should some aspect of our motion in, in some way. So what we can kind of expect is we can solve this equation by some kind of quasi-harmonic oscillation. So it's not purely harmonic because the spring constant changes through the accelerator, but it's close to harmonic where the frequency and amplitude depend on the location in the ring, but show some periodicity 
which follow the periodicity of our accelerator. It repeats after a distance k. That can be one turn or can be even a, a finer uh, repeating distance. So let's solve it. That's, that's our physics intuition, but the solution should have these properties. Let's write down a solution that has those properties and see how far it gets us. So here's a picture of a witch, because in a sense, it's a bit like witchcraft we're about to do. I'm going to write down a solution that has those properties. That's a good, reasonable thing to do. It's called ansatz in physics, right? If it's wrong, we just try something else. But I hate writing down solutions without justification. So it's half intuition, half witchcraft. And this is called the current Snyder formalism. <clears throat> so what we do in this formalism, by, by these two chaps, uh, we assume a solution to Hill's equations inspired by our, our intuition of what the solution should look like. And this is a transverse position through the accelerator. Is x is a function of s, the longitudinal distance, and, and here it is, right? It's harmonic, there's a cosine in there, but the spring constant now depends on position. So the omega, the angular frequency of our cosine, is not just a simple constant, it now depends on s. So some function depends on s inside the cosine, because in different magnets there's different spring constants. We also have some amplitude, maximum amplitude, that depends on s. We have that because the maximum amplitude you can go to is clearly going to be different if it's stronger or weaker focusing. So it's going to have some s-dependent maximum amplitude as well. So all these things you'll see in textbooks, these betas in size, they have real, there's a lot of physical intuition behind them. We also have two constants. Hill's equation is a second order ODE, which have two constants. A and B, here we've got some arbitrary initial phase and some overall scaling epsilon. So epsilon and, and psi naught are just constants. Second order ODE, two constants. It's written in a very su a suggestive form because we've got this sort of square root in here. I've written that as epsilon, I've written that as beta. You know, if you know this, if you've seen this stuff before, you know what they're going to become. But so I've used the standard symbols in the subject from the start. But right now, epsilon and psi naught are just constants. Beta of s is just a, um, an amplitude, and psi of s is giving us a quasi-harmonic structure through the accelerator. So this tells us the transverse position has this form. Now, so beta of, so beta of s is, the, is like an amplitude, the maximum amplitude, that depends on the position around the accelerator. Psi of s is some position-dependent phase. Epsilon is a constant. Because Hill's equation is linear, the constant doesn't appear in it. It's like um, um, an integrate twice you pick up constants but epsilon is very special you know, we, and it's, it's central to our subject and it's called the emittance formally it's called the single particle emittance real formally it's called the action but i don't call it the action because that's potentially confusing but you'll see books calling it the action if i was doing some work upstairs i, I wouldn't dare call it the emittance I, 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 and i'll explain why as time goes on it's a constant that depends on the particle itself the reason is, I think of emittance as being a property of a whole bunch. The bunch has an emittance. An individual particle has a value of this constant. So calling them both the emittance is potentially confusing. But I call it the emittance because a lot of textbooks do, but it's a bit wrong. So bear that in mind. I hope it wasn't too confusing. But we'll call it the emittance, pretend I'm not. Beta of S is the key quantity in, in, in the formalism. It has many names. Beta function, b envelope function, current Snyder beta function, the amplitude function, and so on. It's always positive. And this is a thing, if you go upstairs to someone doing an optics design and say, Clara, they often start by calculating the beta function in the accelerator. It's a function of position. It's always positive. What it represents is the focusing properties of the lattice. So a small beta is a tightly focused lattice and so and the other way around. And it's also periodic. So the periodicity of our system is reflected in the periodicity of our beta function. Very central quantity. So is our ansatz correct or not? What do you do? Well, you compute, you have to stick it back in the Hill's equations to see what happens. So if you just take the derivatives of our ansatz, put them back into the equation, equation of motion, Hill's equations, it's about this much algebra, you know, two thirds of a page, worth doing. You, you'll find two terms when you do so. One proportional to sine and one proportional to cosine. Because Hill's equation equals naught, the coefficient of these two have to vanish separately. And if we impose that condition on, i.e. what's the condition so the ansatz is indeed a solution to our equation of motion, then we actually end up with these two conditions. They're the conditions of beta 
uh, and psi have to obey if the ansatz is indeed a solution to our equation of motion. We have two differential equations. Not, uh, not very scary, ordinary ODEs. Actually, the second one is trivial because I can just rewrite it trivially as that. Beta times psi dash all, all, all dashed, where dash is just d by ds. And I can integrate that straight away to give me a product that beta and psi star is equal to 1, where 1 is an arbitrary choice of initial conditions. That I, I don't care what it is. I just choose a constant to be unity. So what that means is, if beta psi dash equals 1, that means I find this relation straight away, that psi of s is related to beta of s, if that ansatz is a solution to the equation of motion. So the phase that appears inside the cosine is actually given by what the integral along the beam line of 1 over the beta function. So the phase advance, or call all the beta tron phase advance, is related in a one-to-one -one relationship to the beta function. Once I know the beta function, the function of s, I integrate it, I find the phase, the phase advance of the product. So that's important. So that's a very, very important equation. Uh, so the position-dependent phase is related to an integration of 1 over the beta function along the beam line. So knowing the beta function means I can know the phase function. Now, using that equation, well, actually the one on the previous slide, I can eliminate the phase function from the first of those differential equations to get a differential equation for the beta function just in terms of the beta function, not the phase, and also k, where k is our magnet distribution along the beam line. That's our gradient distribution. So there I have it. There's the defining equation for the beta function in an accelerator. It's a differential equation. It depends on beta d squared beta by ds squared, uh, d, d beta by ds, and there's a term with a portion of the beta squared. So I can go away, if I know where my quadrupoles are, I know k, because that's just the gradient divided by rigidity, that was, that was what we did last week, I can then solve this differential equation, and I can find the beta function as a function of s for the accelerator. That then tells me the maximum amplitude of my particle as it oscillates through the machine. That's true. But no one ever does that. No one ever solves that equation. I mean, I've never solved it in my life numerically. You, just, you don't need to. There's other ways of doing it. But, but it does give you the beta function. So I know the distribution of focusing strengths, where mm -hmm. the quadrupoles are, their gradients, hence their k values, which is gradient over rigidity. I can solve this and get beta as a function of s, which is the key quantity in our formulas. But no one ever does it. Finally, we define two functions, alpha and gamma. With beta, the three functions together, we call them the lattice functions, alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha is the gradient of beta with a fa factor of minus a half, just to be perverse and make it complicated to interpret alpha diagrams. And gamma, which is 1 plus alpha squared divided by beta. So, they're, they're, so there's three functions. Beta is the main one. Alpha is, is gradient, doing a factor of minus a half. And gamma is a a composition of alpha and beta. We'll see what these mean physically as time goes on, especially gamma. This has quite a lot of use for us. So, the ellipse. I don't know if you've come across the ellipse yet in, in, in other contexts. This is where it's about to appear for us, and, and I'll do it really slowly, just so you can really see what's going on. Once the beta function is known, hence alpha, its gradient, and hence gamma, combination of alpha and beta, the motion of a single particle is completely specified if I determine, if I give you its initial conditions. For us, the initial conditions were the, uh, the initial psi naught and that epsilon, that overall constant, which is uh, the root of epsilon in our current Snyder ansatz. So I give you three things. I give you, I tell you where the quadrupoles are. You know just, uh, where the, what the k's are doing is a function of s. That determines your focusing distribution. Then, for, for a given particle going through that, I've got to give you two bits of information. It's initial phase, it's initial, it's particle's initial emittance, and then I can compute its motion perfectly through that system. That's what's going on. So, how does it work? Well, this is our motion of our particle. That totally specifies as linear motion of the accelerator in terms of these two guys, which I get from the magnets, and these two guys, which are its, its particle's initial conditions. If I differentiate this, I get uh, dx by ds, which is just this. There's two terms because I've got 
S appearing several times in my expression. If I then combine them in this way, so I take beta times x, x prime plus alpha times x, I can cancel a few terms off and I end up looking something like that. Either you'll see in a second why I do that, you just think in terms of mechanics, Lagrangian dynamics, Hamiltonian dynamics, this quantity here, this is for theorists among you, looks kind of conjugate to that quantity. If you know what that phrase means, great, appreciate it. If you don't, don't worry, it doesn't matter. I've simply just formed this quantity. Now, what it means is if I then form this quantity, x squared plus beta x prime plus alpha x all squared, if I just form that for fun, and I just take that quantity and I form it, if I stick in my definition of x, x prime and x, I'll find loads of stuff cancels and it simply comes down to being epsilon times beta. So, uh, okay, so if I then expand the square, cancel through by beta, I arrive at this bottom equation. So forget about how we got there, just look at that equation, right? That equation says that if I just calculate the quantity gamma x squared plus two alpha x x prime plus beta x prime squared, it equals epsilon. Now, what's epsilon? Epsilon is the initial condition for our particle. That's where I initially put it in the calculation. So then I launch it through the accelerator. The k's are different, it oscillates all over the place. But if so, the initial condition is still the initial condition. That's never going to change. So going through the accelerator, beta, alpha, and gamma all depend on position. At a given point in my accelerator, there's a beta function, there's an alpha function, there's a gamma function. x and x prime are the, locate, are the coordinates of the particle as it moves through the accelerator. They all depend on s as well. So every little bit in this equation depends on s. x and x prime particle coordinates, beta, alpha, gamma, depend on position. You know, everything's changing as s advances through the accelerator. But whenever I form this very, very special quantity, it always equals the same number, epsilon. It's a conserved quantity. And that's the point, if you like, of this, of this um, emittance quantity. So that's good. Um, check that for yourself, check the algebra, but you'll find that this quantity on the left-hand side is an invariant of our formalism. So, well, I, I've just said all this, but I'll say it again because it's well important. That's our equation for the invariant. So every point in the accelerator, we have a value for alpha, beta, and gamma. They depend on the lattice, K, the focusing. At a particular point, if I combine the particle position and angle with the lattice functions, I get an invariant, which was the admittance we saw in solution to Hill's equations in the current Snyder formulas. So as a particle moves to the next point in the accelerator, we have different lattice functions. There's different focusing. We get, we get a different position and angle. But if we form this guy, it always comes out to be the same value. In other words, the emittance, a little epsilon, the root epsilon and the current Snyder ansatz, is a constant of the particle. It remembers it all time as it goes through the accelerator. Although, as I said, emittance is probably a bad name. That's a personal comment. That's for more of a coffee discussion than anything, really. So, the ellipse. And I don't know how much you've studied uh, ellipses. Uh, uh, maybe not much at all. You all know the equation of a circle, right? x squared over a squared plus x prime squared over b squared equals some constant. So but you may have seen this equation. Now forget about particles for a second, no accelerators. We're just in a, you know, discussing geometry. That expression there in the x, x prime plane, where alpha, beta, gamma, and epsilon are four constants, describes, traces out, or all the x and x primes that obey that equation Will, will, will all lie on some ellipse, where alpha, beta, gamma, epsilon are the parameters of that ellipse. It's uprightness, it's size, all this kind of stuff. I mean, so if, we just, if alpha is equal to zero, that means we'd have gamma x squared plus beta x prime squared equals epsilon. That's just the equation of a circle. So you can see straight away that alpha is telling us the deviation of our ellipse away from a beautiful circle. That's what alpha is doing for us. So, so just imagine there was no, uh, no cross term, what would it look like in x prime plane? And the answer is a circle. So you have seen this before. You just have the cross term is giving you your ellipsiness away from its circle. So, sorry, I've been quite a jammy bit. 
<laughs> so, so this function describes an ellipse in the xx prime plane with ellipse parameters described by alpha, beta, and gamma. So he's, he, he here is an ellipse for a choice of x of alpha, beta, gamma, epsilon. I've done it in the y, y prime plane just to point out that this formalism works in both planes. You know, so now this is in y, y prime. So and I've marked on here the uh, uh, geometrical parameters. So for example, the point where this ellipse projects down to the, this axis is given by the root of beta times epsilon in terms of geometrical parameters. That makes sense because remember, root beta emitters is what multiplied our overall cosine. So that's the maximum amplitude the cosine can oscillate to because it goes to plus or minus one. So it makes sense that as this particle moves around the ellipse, as it will do in a sec, its maximum amplitude is given by that quantity. Similarly, the projection onto the y-axis, the angular axis, is given by the root of gamma times the emittance. They're results of standard geometry. I remember when I was at uh, Jemaya levels and stuff, we, I, I didn't do ellipses either. I had to, when I came across this uh, after my PhD, because uh, my PhD was in theoretical part physics, not accelerated physics, I had to remember what the equation of the ellipse was, go back to school and do it. You know, you don't often come across it. So it's good exercise to remember that that is the equation of an ellipse, and these are just parameters. Um, so what beta controls is the extent on the x-axis, gamma controls the extent on the x-prime axis, and alpha tells you how ellipsy it is. Alpha of naught, it's a pure circle. You can see that from the equation. A bigger value of alpha, the more stretched out the ellipse is. It, alpha is positive and negative, which quadrants the ellipse goes through. Um, so the area of ellipse, found geometrically, if I have an ellipse, no particles, just for a second, just ellipses, is given by that. The area of this guy is given by pi times the constant on the right-hand side. So pi times our remittance, our conserved quantity, is the area of the ellipse. So straight away, you think, well, hang on, I start to get, I start to get this now, because if alpha, beta, gamma tell me the orientations and, and the stretchiness of the ellipse, but the area is epsilon, epsilon's our constant. So as this ellipse evolves through the accelerator, the area will be preserved, and the focusing will simply distort it and change it and stretch it as alpha, beta, and gamma change through the accelerator. So the area is given by pi epsilon, which means the area of our ellipse transcribed by a given particle is constant. So that's that's key. That's that's the central bit. And in an exercise for you, um, you'll see the answer in a couple of slides. If, if, um, if it sits, if, if a particle, let's freeze time, it's sitting there, some value of y and y prime, at some point in the accelerator, some value of alpha and beta, which way around the ellipse does it move? Does a particle move clockwise or anticlockwise? That's a fun exercise to do. So let's just get this idea of an ellipse a bit more clearer. So the last parameters are functions of the focusing of the lattice. So every point in the lattice has a value of the lattice function. And so, and every, so every point on the lattice has its own orientation of the ellipse, alpha, beta, gamma. A given particle has its... That's a, a, a grammar error there, there should be no apostrophe. Has, has its own value of the emittance. So setting the area of the ellipse, it moves around. So a given particle has an emittance, that sets its area of its ellipse, but the orientation of it is given by the focusing of the lattice properties. So let's play a little game. We sit at a fixed point in the ring and watch a single particle turn by turn by turn. This can be done with a computer code with our matrices. You should do it. So turn one, it's a y1, y1 prime. I'll wait for a turn, it comes back around to me again. It's now a different position and angle, y2, y2 prime, y3, y3 prime, y4, y prime. And, but if I look at what happens, here's my coordinates, my particle, turn after turn after turn. Because alpha, beta, gamma are the same at my fixed location, the ellipse is always the same, the area is conserved. Turn one, turn two, turn three, turn four, turn five. So the particle just traces out an ellipse, turn after turn after turn, if I just sit and watch it turn after turn after turn. It always moves around this ellipse. But what happens moving along a beam line? Well, here we have a beam line going from left to right, three positions, S1, S2, S3. S1 has lattice functions, alpha, beta, gamma. They depend on the lattice. S2 has lattice functions. S3 has lattice functions. So at each point, the ellipse 
has a different orientation and pointiness, if you see what I mean. But if I have some particle, this blue, this blue particle, it has an emittance. So this ellipse also has some area. So at this point, that's the particle there. The ellipse has this orientation, has this area, it's sitting there. And then move to this point, S2. Now the ellipse looks like this because the alpha, beta, and gamma are different. It's moved round, it's moved round to a different point on the ellipse, but the area is the same. So the particle moves through the accelerator going around this ellipse. I know I'm hammering this home, the point that home very a lot, but this really is a central point of the current Snyder formalism. So the beta function, this is our big central quantity in the formalism. It's a positive function of position around the machine and has the periodicity of the lattice itself. It's determined by the function properties of the lattice, the accelerator, and it's a function you routinely calculate in optics design and beam dynamics, and also in operational accelerators as well. We measure it, and I'll show you some measurements of, of this guy in a sec. It's generally maximized in a focusing quadrupole, minimized in a defocusing quadrupole. I'll, um, I'll, uh, I will prove that probably after coffee. Uh, here's some examples. So here's a beam line. This is a function of position, and this is the beta function in the two planes. Red is the horizontal plane, and uh, blue is the vertical plane. So that's beta x and beta y. This notation here you'll often see in, 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 in optics codes. This tells you where your quadrupoles are. So a little hump above the line is a horizontally focusing quadrupole, and a little hump below the line is a vertically focusing quadrupole, so a horizontally defocusing quadrupole. So this is horizontal beta, so it's that's a horizontally focusing quadrupole, so beta is focused down horizontally and then back up again and oscillates with the same periodicity as your quadrupoles in your lattice. I couldn't remember which colour was the, the horizontal beta function, but I just remember that that's a horizontally focusing quadrupole, so because this guy's pushed down by it, that must be the horizontal beta function. So I don't need a label, and neither will you. You can look at these plots and figure it out pretty quickly now. Here's a better example. Here's a beta function in the LHC, something we work on right here in the Cockroft Institute. Um, this is a function of position, so it goes to what, for 1.2 kilometres around Atlas, or CMS, the same optics. Uh, X, so uh, the left-hand side is giving you the beta function values in X and Y, and you can see at this point here, we'll study this probably in two, three weeks' time, that's the interaction point of the two beams, where you want a very, very small beam, so you have a very, very tight, very small beta function to, to, to reduce the beam size down. You can see here, this is a different notation. These, this, this, is a, this is mad now directly, I made it mad. That's the dipoles in the LHC arc. So we have a periodic optics. So you see periodic beta functions, quite small and tight. Then we have, this is no dipoles, a straight section. You can see quadrupoles. So you can just see the notation there. That little hump there is above the axis. So that's a horizontally focusing quadrupole. So that's going to bring the beta function down. And it's and it grows here to very, very big values. We'll derive that in three weeks' time. And it comes back down again to the interaction point. So that's a beta function. There's loads of information there. Um, this green line we'll also study in three weeks' time. That's something called the dispersion function. That, that, that tells you what off momentum particles are doing. Okay, so that's a beta function. A, a typical values of it, you can see it's a few hundred meters typically in the arcs, and we focus it right down to half a meter at the interaction point. But beta functions, uh, I think you get kind of a feeling for as time goes on. Also, we could measure the beta function. So this is measurements of the beta function in the LHC. You measure something by changing something to change that quantity. So in, in this case, we change the quadrupole settings, change the k's, change the beta function. And this is what's called beta beat. We'll derive this again in three weeks time, uh, where this is the deviation of the beta function measured to its ideal value divided by the ideal value. So zero would be a perfect ideal nominal beta function, but you can see the the beta beta in the LHC is about plus or minus 20%. So the beta function in the whole ring is coming out to 20% of what should be called the design. That was a world record for goodness of beta function. So, but you can measure it in both planes and it's quite a nice, um, nice plot to see. So the beta function is a real measurable thing. How do you find it? Oh no, sorry. First of all, how do you write down the transfer matrix using 
the current Snyder or lattice functions. This is a very powerful tool. So what we're going to do is we're going to write down the transfer matrix in between two points in terms of lattice functions at those two points. Already, I've anticipated a cool result. You can do that. If I have alpha, beta, gamma here, alpha, beta, gamma here, the map between those two points only depends on, on, on those functions at each end, not what happens in the middle. They're pretty, they're pretty good at lattice functions. So to begin with, let's return to the, uh, our current Snyder ansatz to Hill's equation. It uh, depends on two constants. Before we had a epsilon and a, a psi naught. We'll just write it in a slightly different form where we have a cos and a sine solution, where, but now we have, instead of our two constants uh, before, we have C1 and C2. That's just a standard transformation to a different form of the solution. We don't know C1 and C2. We're, we're about to figure them out. But at the, at the place S, S equals naught, our initial conditions, let's say that the beta function is beta naught, alpha is alpha naught, that determines gamma, because the gamma depends on alpha and beta, and the initial phase, this initial size, just naught. We pick that, because we can. So if initially the particle is at x naught and x naught prime, we actually just stick that back into this equation and fix our unknown constants. You do that as two or three lines of algebra. So it means we can write x as a function of s in terms of alpha, beta, and gamma at that location and at the initial condition point. So we have this equation here. So that's pretty. That's still pretty amazing. That tells me my position, my particle's position as a function of s, if I know its initial alpha, beta, gamma, and I know alpha, beta, gamma at, at the point I'm interested in. That's what that tells us. Then. We, we note that that expression was linear in x naught and x naught prime. I've rewritten it for you here, so you can see x as a function of s is a whole bunch of stuff times the initial x naught, whole bunch of stuff times the initial x naught prime. It's linear in the initial conditions, so I can write it as a matrix, that linear algebra again. For that, I also need to know x prime as a function of s, which I simply differentiate that expression to get half a page of algebra, you've got a whole bunch of S's hanging around, so you know you have to use a product rule a few times and, or, and a chain rule. I want, uh, that's an exercise, but then once I've done that, I've got X and X prime at some position S1 and as a linear function of X and X prime at some initial position X naught, where the constants in this matrix depend on alpha, beta, and gamma. That's the, that's the cool bit. So that, if you do it, you, this is the answer you get. So that's the, that's the transfer matrix for a, a particle's positioning angle from S, uh, S0 to S1. And it depends only on alpha, beta, gamma, and the phase at S0 and S1, nothing in between. That's the point of a linear approximation. So 0 and 1, beginning end of the transfer map. So the transfer matrix between the two points is purely determined by the last function at each point and the phase advance between the points. That's that. that Think of the LHC, how complicated it is, but that, 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 that result holds. So I can compute my proton's motion just by knowing alpha, beta, gamma at some point in the accelerator. Now, well, how about the one-turn map? I've got a few more minutes before I have a break. The one-turn map, strictly the one-period map, it, it applies at any periodicity, not just the one-turn periodicity, is a really important quantity. That's our transfer map, our general transfer map between two points, S0 to S1, where there, there could be different points. No periodicity, no nothing. But what if I went round one turn back to the same point? Now, if I go start at one point and go round one turn, I get back to the same point, beta is the same as it was before, alpha as it was before, and so is gamma. So beta naught and beta one are just equal to beta, alpha naught, it's the same point, right? So they're the same quantities. So gamma, alpha, and beta. So the one turn map I can write as this. So that's the map to do one turn of my accelerator back to some point in S. And that, that point in S has an alpha, beta, and gamma, which are these guys here in the matrix, and also there's some psi, which is the phase advance for one turn around my accelerator. So that means I can write down, in a really simple looking form, if I, if I know alpha, beta, gamma at some point in the accelerator, the action of one whole turn of that accelerator is simply given by those functions. And I can write down a very, very simple transfer matrix that tells me that it's just equal to that. Where, where big psi is just psi 1 minus psi naught. So I have a, so look at this guy, this accelerator here, really complicated, really long, loads of elements. If I just go to this point here, 
you know, and I know the the phase advance for one turn, alpha, beta, and gamma at that point, I can just take a particle that's here and see where it is one whole turn later by simply applying this very simple looking matrix. So the linear approximation you have in this formula is pretty useful. We can use this to figure out the lattice functions. If you turn on MAD, give it the LHC lattice, ask what beta is at a given point or what the one turn phase advance is, this is exactly what it does in its code. So I give you, I, I give you an accelerator, quadrupoles, drifts, how strong they are. You know the matrix for each of those elements. You times them all together to get the one turn map by direct replication of all the elements. We now know this has this very simple form. So if I just get, take the accelerator, time all the elements together, get the total matrix for one turn of the accelerator. It could be really complicated and it would be really complicated. If it's numerical, it's just numbers. And it's just equal to that. So, but, but that's equal to the matrix on the previous slide. So I don't know alpha, beta, gamma yet. I've just times k's and l's and things together for one whole turn, but it's equal to that very precise form. So if, we, so, so, so if we have the one turn map, we can get the one turn phase advance from the trace of this matrix. Because if you just go back a slide, if I look at the trace of this matrix, the sine terms cancel, the trace is just two cos psi, where psi is the one turn phase advance. So if I know the trace of my matrix, I can compute the one turn phase advance, dead simply. So the phase advance for one turn is simply the R cos of the trace divided by two, and that's what MAD will do to compute it. So you have your numerical matrices for a given quadrupole, times them all together, you get a numerical matrix here, the trace of it tells you the one turn phase advance. Similarly, I then just read off alpha, beta, gamma, because beta is just m12 divided by sine of psi. You read that off from the form of the one turn map in terms of the current spider functions. Alpha is equal to that, and gamma is equal to that. So if you turn on mad, feed it load of quadrupole strengths, it'll times matrices together, take the trace, find beta from this, and if you look in the mad physics manual, you just see these very equations. So we've derived them and understood where they come from. One, one really useful property, if I want the phase advance to be a real number, so look at my current Snyder formulas, and I, I want that. That's the, that's the implicit assumption. I only get that if I can do this R cos and get a sensible answer. So that means I need the trace to be less than or equal to two. Imagine the trace was four, I would do an R cos of two, which is not a sensible thing to do if you want a real valued answer. So my machine, my accelerator is only stable. I have a real proper value of a one term phase advance. And the, and the condition for that, we can read off from the trace of our one turn map. So the question, is an accelerator stable, at least linearly, actually the same as, is the trace of my one turn map less than or equal to two? And, for, and this is the reason for a real valued phase advance. Right, what's next? Well, there's an exercise coming up and then we can have a break. So. Again, this rhetorical exercise, I haven't got to do it. But uh, so, especially the lattice functions in terms of matrix elements show that the condition that determinant m equal to one is the same as that. So all the things we've had so far, all the matrices, they've all had unit determinant. Can you show that this is the same as gamma equals one plus alpha squared over beta? Simply by, this is our general expression for the one turn map. Find the determinant of this guy. If it's equal to one, then you must have this condition holding. That, that's dead simple. But the point of that actually is slightly more interesting. So that's just turning the handle. We have a two by two matrix. We have four parameters if they're real, right? Four elements. If we want the determinant to be equal to one, this drops to three. So the fact that det m is equal to one is actually linked to the conservation of phase space area. But assume for a second that's a thing we want to have. We actually have three unknown parameters. So if I want to parameterize a general real matrix, which has det m equal to one, I need three parameters. Um, and the phase advance is four, and then because we know, because we then have this condition, three lattice functions and the phase advance drops to three. 